Okay, well, we're going to Colossians chapter 1 tonight. Before we do, I wanted to read you a poem by Linnell Johnson called A Good News Day. It's a good news day, no blues day, new shoes, no way to lose. What a good news day. It's a great day, I can't wait day. Lift your voice, let's rejoice, my Lord, a good news day. It's a payday, going my way day. No nay, all oh, yay, what you say, such a good news day. <clears throat> it's a live it up day, overflowing cup day. It's a bright and bubbly, doubly lovely, show enough, good news day. I think that sets the heart of Colossians. So we go to verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. First of all, it's Paul again writing to the believers. He was the one that fathered them in the word, that started the movement of the word in that province of Asia, and Colossae was a part of that province. Remember, he spent two years and three months in Asia, in which all the word heard, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And that means Colossian, the Colossians had to hear about it too during that time. And it says, an apostle. He was an apostle or one who is sent. An apostle is one who is sent to bring new light to a generation. It may be old light, but it's new to that generation. And of course, the things that were revealed to Paul at this time that he brought to the people regarding the mystery, had never been made known before. And therefore, it was totally new light to that generation. And it says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the correct order. It's not Christ Jesus, because an apostle is one who serves. And whenever it's in the category of service or the context of service, it will put Jesus, the humiliated one, first, followed by Christ, the glorified one. Otherwise, it would put the glorified one first, Christ Jesus. But in this context, it's service. He's an apostle. So he's an apostle of whom? Of Jesus Christ. Putting the emphasis on the humiliated one or the service. An apostle of Jesus Christ, or as we translated it, Jesus Christ's apostle. By the will of God. The word will is that Greek word thelema, T-H-E, L long E, M-A, thelema. And it means the intense desire. There's another word that means absolute determination, but this is not it. This is not that word for will in the sense of absolutely determining something. It's the intense desire. Now, determination could also be uh, included, but the emphasis is on God's intense desire. That's how he became an apostle. Not because you wanted to or I wanted to or because Paul wanted to. That's not how you get a ministry. It's because of God's intense desire. He knows what the needs are and he's working in your heart to will and to do of his good pleasure. And as long as you don't have your foot on the hose, God can work with you. See, but you got to get your foot off the hose sometime. So, by the will, the intense desire of God. And, Timotheus, an apostle? No. Timotheus, a brother. Our is in italics. A brother. He's not here referred to as an apostle, but he was simply one of the brothers. I think that is significant. Because, first of all, Paul was a Judean in background. Timothy, his father was a Greek. His mother was a Judean, but his father, the bloodline, was a Greek. So you have both a Judean and a Gentile, a Greek in background, writing, and they're writing with unity of purpose because of the one body that brought them together. And what's the context of Colossians? The mystery, the one body. And the big problem is not holding the head, who is Christ. So here's Timothy, a 
Greek, basically, in background because of his father, and Paul, a, a, a Judean in background, writing together to the Colossians, and it's one body, the mystery. That'll become more significant later. And he's a brother. A brother, Paul was the apostle. He was the one that fathered them in the Word. Timothy was a brother. And yet they learned many things from Timothy. Later on in 1 Timothy, Paul says he sent him back to Asia to ordain certain people and do a lot of things, get things running in order in Asia. Because Timothy was one of the tremendous leaders at that time. But Timothy, he's here called a brother. I think of this in many of our lives. Dr. Werwell's the one that fathered all of us in the Word, right? But I'm not your father, or Reverend Martindale, or others in the ministry, other leaders. We're brothers. We're brothers, and I've always looked on the core as my brothers. I certainly don't look at you as my children. It's a whole different situation. But we're, you know, you got one father in a family, but you got many brothers. And maybe I'm a little older brother, been around a little longer, and sometimes you can learn from your older brother, sometimes you fight with your older brothers. But that's neither here nor there. We're <laughs> the relationship is different, understand? Same way with our other leaders. We're more like brothers, and some of them, if you know, if they're your leader, they may be an older brother in the body. So I think it's a tremendous title for Timothy here because you need that father and you need that brother that you work with. And it's one body. Now, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. The word saints is that word that means holy or a separated one. One who is set apart. He's separated, set apart. He's holy. That's what the word holy means. And the word faithful means one who believes. In Aramaic, literally it says a believing one. One who believes or believing you could translate it. A faithful person is one who is believing. Not an unbeliever. But he's believing to the point that he is faithful. He's steadfast. He continues to believe in his walk. And then it says, brothers. This is the only church epistle that addresses them as brothers in the opening salutation. Now remember in the book of Galatians, it called them brothers a number of times, but not in the opening salutation. This is the only epistle that addresses them as brothers in the opening salutation. Because they were brothers, like Timothy was a brother. They were all part of that one body. And God is the Father. But we're all brothers. In addition to that, the word separated one and believing, both are adjectives which modify brothers. Now you don't get that from the King James, where it says saints, but if you translated it holy or set apart, then you'd get that idea. These are holy and faithful brothers, or set apart and believing brothers. See that? In Christ, many of the manuscripts in Greek read, in Christ Jesus. The Aramaic reads in Jesus Christ, but the Aramaic normally uses that phrase for in Christ Jesus because of their language. Very seldom, I think only four or five times you see the order Christ Jesus in the Aramaic. But that's because of their language. They wouldn't do it that way as a rule. But here you have in Christ Jesus in many of the manuscripts and I believe that that's what it should be because Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 starts out with um, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, 
to the saints and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Philippians also, chapter 1. Starts out, Paul and Timothy, it's the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus. I think all three of these are addressed to those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's more than just that they're born again. They're getting more than the foundational doctrine. They're getting the advanced class. Which reminds me, that advanced class is just the best class in the world today, I think. Um, every time I see those things, it just blows my mind. Besides that, it's funny. You know, that's, it's better than watching any movie or anything else. I mean, it's got everything in it besides the greatness of God's Word and truth. And boy, it teaches you the principles of walking by the Spirit. Absolutely tremendous. Well, anyway, this was the advanced class of their time. <laughs> Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And they're not addressed to the neophyte. They're not addressed to the newly born again believer that needs the foundational doctrine. They're addressed to those that are holy, set apart, and faithful in Christ Jesus. They're identified with Christ Jesus and they're in fellowship with Him. They're not just, you know, tagging along or just having to get excited and now they moved into the fellowship, but they're really steadfast in the fellowship. They're in Christ Jesus, identified with Him. That's why all three of these epistles must start with that title or with that phrase. In Christ Jesus. <clears throat> then it says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Aramaic, it reverses these. Peace and grace. Just like it did in Ephesians. Ephesians is peace and grace. And there's a reason not sure I understand all the greatness of it, but the end product of this great knowledge of the mystery, where it's one body, neither Judean nor Gentile, is that there's peace in the body. Ephesians chapter 2 dwells so much on that peace. There's no longer a division between Judean and Gentile, but God's broken down that middle wall of partition Making what? Peace. Peace. And not only peace with each other, but peace with whom? With God. See? Ephesians chapter 2, you ought to read it sometime. Peace. See? And it's because of the grace. And that grace is what makes it available. But peace is the big thing in the one body. And that's what Philippians, I mean Ephesians, and Colossians is all about the great doctrine of the mystery. Philippians simply corrects the practical error. But Colossians the doctrinal error, and Ephesians sets the doctrine. So, peace and grace is good enough for me in both of those epistles. From, and it's the only two epistles that invert that. Everything else is uh, grace and peace. From God our Father. The phrase, and the Lord Jesus Christ, is not in the Aramaic and most of the critical Greek texts. I think it's fantastic that it's omitted. Because in every other epistle, that's what you would see as the normal greeting. At least most of them. I haven't checked every one, but I know it's the normal greeting that you would say, grace to you and peace, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the normal salutation. But why is it so tremendous that it's left off here? <laughs> well, the problem at Colossae was they were not holding the head, right? They were not 
holding the head who is Jesus Christ. So then you would think there would be a reason to put it in here twice. Well, there's that figure ellipsis. I call this an ellipsis of the salutation where you deliberately leave out something that the people would be expected or expecting to hear. In other words, if you're used to hearing me saying, well, grace and peace to you through God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden I'd say, grace and peace to you through God the Father, what's your mind doing? What? What's your mind doing? <laughs> it's saying, come on, tell me the rest of it, right? See? It's a deliberate omission. It's like, um, you know, a music. music. Do you ever hear somebody play a song and leave the last note off? What's your mind doing? Go, uh, uh, come on, give it to me. <laughs> you want that last note, right? Well, you want this. <laughs> it's an ellipsis of the salutation. Because they were not holding their head, the head, Christ, therefore it draws attention to it by leaving it out because they were leaving it out. Now, isn't that something? Boy, I think that's terrific. So anyway, we translate these first two verses here. Paul, Jesus Christ's apostle, by God's will, and Timothy, a brother, to the set-apart and believing brothers in Christ Jesus at Colossae. Peace and grace to you from God our Father. Period. End of greeting. Salutation. Now verse 3 begins the prayer. 3 through 8. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. First of all, it says, we give thanks. Now that isn't what he normally says. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your believing in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you. Who does? I do. I do. I, Paul, I. Is that we? No, it's I. Now look at uh, Philippians 1. Verse 3. I thank my God upon every remember to you. Who does? I do. Paul. Yet in Colossians he says, we do. We give thanks. We who? Paul and Timothy. See? Paul and Timothy. A Judean in background and a Greek in background who are now one body. Part of the one body. See it? We give thanks to God. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. You talk about the accuracy of words. And in this epistle... We're not holding the head part of the mystery, that doctrinal problem. What better way to, to say things than what has been said right here in these opening verses? We give thanks. We do. Terrific. And, the word and, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that word and is omitted in many manuscripts and in the Aramaic. Praying always for you. The word always in the Greek and Aramaic, it, it, uh, Greek is questionable. Aramaic sets it more beautifully. But in both of them, it could and should go with giving thanks rather than praying. We give thanks always or continually, not continuously. It means you give thanks and pray when you're supposed to be praying, not... not um, Every moment of the day, you can't be doing that, folks. Your mind isn't made to do that. Right now, you better be writing and listening. You can pray when I'm telling jokes. <laughs> if I get any. All right. Always means continually. 
not continuously. And it modifies we give thanks, not praying. Praying, in turn, then also modifies the giving of thanks. And it shows you how we give thanks, by praying. Okay? So, that verse we translate, we give thanks continually to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you, but that's not the end of the sentence. Now we go to verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. Now this verse 4 is not a continuation of that sentence. It's a short parenthesis that's thrown in, that's incomplete in itself. And that type of parenthesis is called an epitrechon. You know that one? E-P-I-T-R-E-C-H-O-N. Epitrechon. E-P-I-T-R-E-C-H-O-N. It's a short parenthesis, incomplete by itself. Therefore, whatever verse 3 was saying, praying for you, will be continued then in verse 5. As this is a sideline. Since we heard, or having heard, of your faith, which is believing, in Christ Jesus. Now, two of the manuscripts have in the Lord Jesus. And the Aramaic has in Jesus Christ again, but as I told you before, that's because of their language. Normally that would just be in Christ Jesus. And again, these are the faithful in Christ Jesus. And so, this is not referring just to when they first believed. Like you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Then that title would be appropriate. But, this is, he heard of their believing, which was in Christ Jesus, that which set them apart as the more mature believers, and of the love to all the saints, their love to all the saints. In other words, they weren't, again, neophytes, but they had, and when Paul had heard about this, what did he do? Do he continue to thank God, praying for them? You'll see more of this in when we get to verse five. I want to tell you also that the word love is agape, the love of God in the renewed mind in manifestation. And that the Aramaic adds the word your in front of love. Your love to all the saints. Which is interesting because many of the Greek texts adds the words that are in italics in a King James Version. Which you have. That would be another way of saying your. The love which you have or your love to all the saints. So I believe that is correct to add that there. So we parenthesis having Part, having heard of your believing, which is in Christ Jesus, and your love to all those who are set apart. The saints, of course, are the set apart ones. He still could have been there, right? We covered this last week, but not on this particular verse. But he heard about their believing in Christ Jesus. It was more than just believing in the Lord Jesus, just getting saved, but they. Christ Jesus, they were steadfast. And where did he hear that from? Well, verse 7 says, As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. It was Epaphras who taught him the advanced class. Paul could still have taught him the foundational things. He could have been there. No problem with that. But at least Epaphras was the one that taught him the greatness of God's Word 
regarding the mystery and so on, and what caused them to believe, you know, get settled in their believing. Love the saints with the love of God. He's the one that worked with them. Epaphras did. So it doesn't prove anything as far as it, whether Paul was there or not. All right. Matter of fact, Ephesians 1, 15, we read it. it. says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your believing in the Lord Jesus and loved unto all the saints. Hey, wasn't Paul at Ephesus? Oh, if it says I heard about it, that doesn't mean Paul wasn't there. We know he was there. Because of the hope, or for the hope, which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Let me ask you a question. Is this thing cutting in and out or just my ears? So i got to yell once in a while so you can hear me. I'll do my best. Okay, for, the word for. In verse 5. It indicates the cause for thanks and prayer in verse 3. This word for indicates the cause for their thanks and prayer in verse 3. And can be translated because of in both the Greek and Aramaic. And this verse clearly defines what hope is. Hope is for the future. Hope which is laid up for you. If something is laid up for you, then it's not available now, is it? It's something you anticipate in the future. Hope anticipates. The word laid up means stored. Stored. For you in heaven. Now, the word heaven is plural. Heavens. But that's because of the Hebrew idiom. Or the Semitic idiom. Where they would many times call things of great magnitude by the plural. Doesn't mean you've got several heavens. Means you can't talk about heaven in the singular because it's so big. Same way God is Elohim. Doesn't mean he's more than one God. It just means... He's so big you can't describe him in the singular. It's a figure. So it's heavens. But literally it means heaven in our language. Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Now that is called a dual genitive because you have two genitives there. The word of the truth of the gospel. See that? Two ofs. It's a dual genitive, and those are rare. They're more common in Ephesians and Colossians than in any other epistle. You'll see other figures used in or emphasized in other epistles. In Ephesians and Colossians, this is one of the unique idioms of the language or usages in the language to use that dual genitive for emphasis. It's the word of the truth of the gospel. Now, the word is the truth, right? It's the true word. The word is the truth. And the word is the good news, the gospel. So we translated it, the true word, the good news, the no blues, new shoes. That's what inspired me on that poem tonight. And it'll tie in. It's a good news. No blues, new shoes. Well, every day is a good news day. <laughs> When you're in the Word. And it's not just Word, it's the true Word. See, true describes that same Word in another way. And good news describes it in a third way. See, the emphasis and the impact 
5, then well, I, to get the sense of verse 5 now, start with verse 3 and skip 4 because of the epitruch on there. We give thanks continually to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you because of the hope which is stored in heaven for you. We give thanks. We give thanks. Praying for you because of the hope which is stored in heaven for you. What is the hope that's stored for you? Well, it's your internal life, your inheritance with that goes with that eternal life, and it's the rewards. It's the rewards too. Because verse 4, that epitrechon, that short deviation or side issue, explains having heard of your believing in Christ Jesus and your love to all those who are set apart. They were faithful. They were set. They had great love for the people. They had great believing in Christ Jesus. So would there be rewards? Sure. It just explains that a little bit more. See? If you haven't heard about something, somebody, would you pray for them? Well, you couldn't. See? But when you hear about them, and the more you hear about them, the more they come to your mind, the more you lift them, and throughout the day, God brings somebody to remembrance, or you just remember them and you pray for them, and see? And it's because of the hope, and their hope was more than eternal life. It included the rewards. Because the word, the good news, they had already heard about this hope. They had already heard about it when Epiphras was there, and perhaps Paul too. But they had heard about the great hope they have in the true word, the good news. also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth as ye have also learned of Epaphras our dear fellow servant who is for you a faithful minister in Christ first of all the words is come in the Greek that's exactly what it means but in the Aramaic it's that word kras k-r-a-z kras Karaz, I guess you pronounce it. There's a schwa in there. Karaz means to preach. It's like Keruso in Greek. Only Keruso is not used here in Greek. To preach, to proclaim, which is preached unto you as it is in all the world. The word and is omitted in many texts and brings forth fruit. Most of the critical Greek texts add a phrase after that. Well, it adds a word. Auxano. A-U-X-A. N long O. Auxano. What does it mean? Right. <laughs> to grow, to increase like a plant grows. It greens, greens out, or whatever you call it. You know, it's growing. George Jess always uses the illustrations of trees and animals because he works with them so much. Jesus Christ evidently did too because he used a lot of illustrations of trees and plants and animals in his teaching. But they make great illustrations. Here's one using the tree. The tree grows and it bears fruit. Every year a tree greens out. It grows a little bigger and it produces what? Fruit. And if it stops producing fruit, you might as well get out the axe and have yourself firewood, right? But as long as it keeps growing and bearing fruit, those two things, You've got a good tree. Well, <clears throat> that word, the true word, the good news with no blues, 
is come is preached unto you as it is in all the world, and it brings forth fruit and growth. It grows as it does. Well, brings forth fruit and grows where? What was the last thing we left off? In all the world. Then as it doth also in you. Now he brings it back to you. What you have here is a beautiful um, introversion. A-B-B-A. You see, which is come to you or is preached to you as in all the world. You, the world. Then it bringeth forth fruit. Where? In the world. As it does in you. So it goes, preach to you. The word, the true word, the good news was preached to you. It's preached to the world. So it brings forth fruit and growth in the world and in you. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful chiastic structure or introversion. A, B, B, A. So, it's not just at Colossae, but it's the word over the world. It's the word or reaching the world with the word, which depends on cross, preaching, go tell. Great theme verse, isn't it? The true word, the good news. <laughs> which is preached to you as in all the world. Reaching the world with the word, go tell. And what happens when you do reach the world with the word by going and telling? It brings forth fruit and growth in the world as it does in you. Since the day ye heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Or the grace of God in all of its truth. In truth, that would be the idiomatic way of saying that. In all of its truth, in all of its beauty, in all of its fullness. Another word here, the word new, K-N-E-W. <laughs> I tell you, these verses are packed. That word new in Greek is epigonosko. E-P-I-G-N-O, long O, S-K, long O, epigonosko. Epigonosko, you know, means to know full or fully and completely. To have full, precise, complete, exact knowledge. The Aramaic word is yada, Y-A-D-A. Another very important word, because it means to know. Yada. However, yada here is used in the extra extensive form. The extra extensive form is that fourth form that we'll get to in Colossians 2.10 where you've read about it in one of the collateral readings, you are completely, 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 complete. Remember that? That's the extra extent. Only used a few times. You know, it's not used in overabundance in the New Testament, but it really intensifies the meaning. It's the extra extensive form. And so, what does it mean then? To know that you know that you know that you know. So it has the same idea as that Greek word, to really know it, to really know it, to know it fully and completely. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> it's an extra extensive English. So anyway, then, as you learned of Epaphras, the word also is, is omitted. 
in most of the texts again. Epaphras was the one that taught them the great truth, the all truth of the word. He taught them, or they knew the grace of God in truth. It was that truth that really worked with them in that province of Asia. Of course, he's mentioned in chapter 4. In verse 12, Epipras, who is one of you, a doulos of Christ, salutes you. So he was with Paul at Rome at this time. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers. That's agonizomai, laboring. He was in the contest, really working fervently for you in what? Prayers. Why? Well, he wasn't there with them. So he, he'd still labor for them, but in prayer. If he was there with them, he'd be teaching them. He'd be with them. He'd be fellowshipping. He'd be ministering to their need. And praying. But now he's not, so what's he doing? He's agonizo mine in prayer. That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And it says, Epaphras, who is one of you. He's one of you. So he was from Colossae. But where did he learn this knowledge of the all truth? Paul was in Ephesus for how long? Two years, three months. Where was he teaching for two of those years? In a school of Tyrannus. I think Epaphras must have been somebody that came from Colossae to Ephesus, got in the core at Tyrannus, and took it back to Colossae. Now, doesn't that make good sense? The school of Tyrannus. So he was a core grad, studied at the school of Tyrannus. Undoubtedly and returned to his hometown of Colossae. He went back, and they were glad he did. Well, anyway. Ephraim, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Minister is diakonos, D-I-A-K-O-N-O-S in Greek. And that's a word we've had before. It's one who has proven himself and serves in any capacity, a deacon. Any, anyone who serves in any capacity, as long as he has first proven himself. A minister of Christ. Why does it say of Christ and why doesn't it say of Jesus Christ? I think because it's the mystery. It's Christ in you. What did he teach him? He's the one that taught him the mystery. He's the one that taught him it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, when he was first there. And it says he's a dear or beloved fellow servant. The word fellow servant. In um, Aramaic, it's kanatha. K-N-A-T-H-A. In Greek, it's sun doulos. S-U-N and then doulos. And it means a slave together, bond slave together. The emphasis of the use of fellow servant in Colossians try, ties directly into the correction of this doctrinal, their doctrinal error of the epistle. One of the main problems at Colossae was their failure to hold Christ as the head. Christ was the head. In Colossians 1 7 and again in 4 7, Epaphras and Tychicus are singled out by the use of this word, fellow slave, as examples to the Colossians of the correct lifestyle. If Christ is the head of the one body, 
And that makes us servants, slaves, bond slaves. But we are slaves together. Sundulas. See it? In the one body. And that's the key, or a key, to the success of the one body. Is not trying to be lords over God's heritage, but willing to be a bond slave, but not each slave going his own direction, but working together under that one head. Isn't that terrific? Great example, Epiphras was to. The word fellow slave occurs ten times in the New Testament. Five times in Matthew, three times in the book of Revelation, and twice here in Colossians. I gave both of those to you, Colossians 1, 7 and 4, 7. <clears throat> in Matthew, those five occurrences literally refer to fellow servants or slaves, men whose occupations were bond slaves, who worked together in the same household. They didn't work at cross purposes, they worked together. The occurrences in the book of Revelation refer to those who served in the same way during the same time. Matter of fact, a voice from heaven and an angel also call themselves fellow slaves with John. In Colossians, the fellow slave refers to the bond slave of Christ. The word fellow servant literally means a bond servant, doulos, together with sun, together with another. To be a doulos requires totally selling out to one's master. The servant belongs to him and is branded with his mark. We are branded with the speaking in tongues. Epaphras and Tychicus were sundulos with Paul and the believers. Both Epaphras and Tychicus worked with Paul. The number of references to that effect. Epaphras is called a faithful minister and servant of Christ, laboring fervently for you in prayers and a fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. He is mentioned both at the opening and closing of Colossians. In chapter 1, Epaphras communicated the spiritual love the believers of Colossae had for Paul and Timothy. In chapter 4, Paul communicated the great zeal that Epaphras had for the believers in Colossae. Laodicea, and Heriopolis, specifically praying for their standing to be perfect and complete in all the will of God. Tychicus is called twice a beloved brother and faithful minister. Tychicus also traveled with Paul. Jesus Christ paid the price of redemption for every man and therefore is the master. The believer has been called to a family with Christ as the head. The Colossians needed to acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Lord and to sell out as bond slaves in service to him as Epaphroditus and Tychicus had. And of course that will be central when we get to Colossians chapter 3 where he says, renew your mind. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. See, we're to think heavenly thoughts. Get our thoughts up there on the head, on Christ. As bond slaves working together in the body. And this is the greatness of holding the head. The greatness of holding the head is serving together in the body. That's why he's called the bond slave together with that sun prefix. So, verses 6 and 7. you got to start to get 6. got to start way back in the middle of verse 5. 
you previously heard about this hope in the true word. And don't forget the emphasis, that dual genitive in Greek and Aramaic. The true word, the good news, which has been preached to you, even as it is preached in all the world. So it produces fruit and growth in all the world, even as it has in you from the day you first heard and fully knew with precise knowledge God's grace in all its truth. From the day you first heard and knew that fully knew it, God's grace in all of its truth. When Epaphras declared it, the advanced class, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the mystery, the one body. You learned this truth, verse 7, from Epaphras, our beloved fellow slave, who is a faithful servant of Christ on your behalf. Then verse 8, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Love is agape, the love of God in the renewed mind and manifestation, which they heard about up in verse 4. Paul heard about it. Where did he hear it from? Epaphras. Epaphras. They not only loved the saints, they loved Paul and Timothy. And Epaphras related that to them. And it's love in the Spirit. Spirit, there is usage six. Spiritual. So we translated it. He has related your spiritual love for us. Isn't that a tremendous section? I'd like to read it again to you, the whole thing, starting from the beginning. Paul, Jesus Christ's apostle, by God's will, and Timothy, a brother to the set-apart and believing brothers in Christ Jesus at Colossae. Peace and grace to you from God our Father. We give thanks continually to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you, having heard of your believing which is in Christ Jesus and your love to all those who are set apart, because of the hope which is stored in heaven for you. You previously heard about this hope in the true word, the good news, which has been preached to you even as it is preached in all the world. So it produces fruit and growth in all the world even as it has in you from the day you first heard and fully knew with precise knowledge God's grace in all its truth. You learned this truth from Epaphras, our beloved fellow slave, who is a faithful servant of Christ on your behalf. He has related your spiritual love for us. See, they weren't way out in left field like the Galatians that we studied last fall. They weren't into that type of doctrinal error from the foundational doctrine. They just weren't holding the head which is the great mystery. And that's where it starts. And that starts with not being willing to serve together in one body. All you say, I'm willing to serve, but I'm going to do it my way. Then you're pulling in different directions. You're not equally yoked. We're bond slaves together. Christ is the head. No man is the head, you know, other than Christ. No other man is the head here upon earth. Christ is, is the head of the body. And we are bond slaves together, working together, and we must hold that head and serve the bread of life to people, reaching the world with the word. It was preached to you, and when that word lives, not only with you, but in other areas all over the world, and with this knowledge that you have of the world. It ought to live. It ought to live like it lives in Zaire. I mean, move like it moves in Zaire. Right here in the United States, you think that's impossible? No. We blame it on culture. We blame it on this, that, the other. Baloney. 
The word ought to move. We ought to get excited about it. We ought to go out there and talk to everything that moves. Doggone it, when you were out there on light bearers, didn't things happen? Why shouldn't that happen every day of your life when you're out there on the field? Boy, it ought to. And when the Word lives and moves in an area, what happens? It produces fruit and growth in all the world. Even as it does in you. To wherever you are in your core, when you're out there on the field, boy, you ought to make it your goal. It's a light bearer's day every day. Reaching the world with the Word, go tell. It's a good news day every day. When you know this word and can put it together.